Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. Before we begin, we would like to thank Darren Hayes, a patron and team member, for his support. Viewing the public debut of the Soviet Union's IS-3 heavy tank at the Berlin Victory Parade of September 1945, the Western powers, including Great Britain, were shocked. As heads of the British, American, and French armies watched these machines clatter down the Charlottenburger Chaussee, they saw the shape of a new generation of heavy tanks. From the exterior, the IS-3 was a tank with well-sloped and apparently heavier armor, a piked nose, wide tracks, and a gun at least 120 millimeters in caliber. At least in appearance, this was superior to anything being fueled by the other victorious Allied powers at the time. The respective officials knew that they had nothing in their arsenal capable of potentially combating this menacing tank that was now in service with an increasingly aggressive USSR. In response, the militaries of these countries began to develop heavy tanks that they hoped would be able to combat the IS-3. The United States would develop the M103 heavy tank, while the French experimented with the AMX-50. Britain went in a different doctrinal direction and created a heavy gun tank. This was a uniquely British designation that was not governed by weight, but by the size of the gun. This vehicle was based on the experimental FV-200 universal tank chassis, and given the official and somewhat long-winded title of Tank Heavy No. 1, 120mm gun FV-214. This vehicle would be better known as the Conqueror. Weighing in at 65 imperial tons with armor up to 13.3 inches thick, the Conqueror was one of the largest and heaviest tanks Britain would ever field. Like the M103 and AMX-50, the Conqueror was armed with a powerful 120mm gun, specifically the Ordnance Quick-Firing 120mm Tank L1 gun. This gun could punch through an impressive 17.3 inches at 1,000 yards, firing armor-piercing discarding Sabo ammunition. This was more than enough to combat the IS-3, but at the time, this was unknown to the British War Office. As such, even greater firepower was investigated. What followed was the FV-215. With its monstrous 1-883mm gun, this vehicle has become something of a legend among enthusiasts of a particular age, largely due to a popular video game. Unfortunately, this has meant that a number of falsehoods have been spread about the vehicle. This article will highlight the truth behind this uniquely British vehicle. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the War Office reviewed the future of the British Army's tank arm. In 1946, it did away with the A designation used on tanks such as the Churchill, A-22, and Comet, A-34. The A number was replaced by the Fighting Vehicle, or FV, number. In an attempt to streamline the tank force and cover all the bases, it was decided that the military needed three main families of vehicles, the FV-100, the FV-200, and FV-300 series. The FV-100s would be the heaviest, the FV-200s would be slightly lighter, and the FV-300s would be the lightest. All three projects were almost cancelled due to the complexity that would have been involved in producing their respective series. In the end, both the FV-100 and FV-300 series were cancelled. The FV-200 hung on in its development, however, as it was projected that it would eventually replace the Centurion. The FV-200 series included designs for vehicles that would fill various roles, ranging from a gun tank to engineering vehicles and self-propelled guns. It was not until later years that the other uses of the FV-200 chassis were explored, such as the FV-219 and FV-222 armored recovery vehicles. The first of the FV-200 series was the FV-201, a gun tank that started development in 1944 as the A-45. This tank weighed around 55 imperial tons. At least two or three FV-201s were built for testing, but the project went no further than that. Work on the project ceased in 1949. As the heavy number two part of the designation implies, the FV-215 was intended to be the successor of the FV-214 Conqueror, heavy number one. The vehicle was also known as the FV-215 Heavy Anti-Tank Gun SP, SP standing for self-propelled. The project started life in mid-1949 and was aimed at increasing the firepower of the heavy gun tanks. A requirement was formulated for a tank armed with a gun capable of defeating a 60-degree sloped plate 6 inches thick at up to 2,000 yards, a feat impossible even for the powerful 120mm L1 gun of the FV-214. By 1950, Major General Stuart B. Rollins, Director General of Artillery, had concluded that there was no such gun available with that level of ballistic performance. Initially, the British military looked at the development of a 155mm gun that would be standardized with the U.S. However, even this lacked the required punch. As such, 6.5 and 7.2-inch high-explosive squash head shells were looked at. 
At this time, the British Army was of the opinion that a kill did not necessarily mean the complete destruction of an enemy vehicle. A damaged gun or blown off track was also seen as a kill as it took the enemy vehicle out of action. This is known as an M-kill, short for mobility. A K-kill would be the destruction of a vehicle. The term used for this method at the time was disruption, not destruction. The 6.5 or 165mm high explosive squash head was not thought to be powerful enough to kill a heavily armored target in this manner unless it hit a bare armor plate. Attention therefore turned to the larger 7.2 or 183mm shell, which Major General Rollins thought would be powerful enough to render the target inoperable and therefore kill it wherever it impacted. The projected gun was designated the 180mm Lily White. The background to this name is unknown. It may be an interpretation of the rainbow code used by the War Office to identify experimental projects. The red Cyclops flame gun attachment for the FV-201 and the orange William experimental missile launcher are examples of this. If this was the case, however, the name should be White Lily. It must be said that this is all speculation and no evidence exists to support this theory. These shells were all 183 millimeters in diameter. However, it was not until December 1952 that the designation of the gun was officially updated to 183 millimeters. The design for the gun was accepted and was serialized as the Ordnance Quick Firing 183 millimeter tank L4 gun. The 183 millimeter L4 became one of the largest and most powerful tank guns in the world. With the gun developed, the rest of the vehicle was designed around it. It is estimated that the vehicle would have cost between 1.4 and 1.9 million modern pounds per unit. Based on the Conqueror adaptation of the FV200 chassis, the hull of the FV215 would have shared some similarities. For example, the hull would have been 25 feet long. It would have been slightly narrower than the FV214 at 12 feet compared to 13.1 feet. With a planned height of 10.6 feet, the FV215 would have been slightly shorter than the FV214. Unladen, the vehicle would have weighed 61 imperial tons, while being in battle order would have seen the weight climb to 65 imperial tons. The FV215 would have been operated by a five-man crew consisting of the commander on the turret's left, the gunner on the turret's front right, two loaders on the turret's rear, and the driver in the hull's front right. While the basic chassis and running gear remained the same as the FV214, the layout of the rest of the vehicle was completely changed. Instead of following the conventional tank layout for the FV215 with a centrally mounted turret, the designers produced a rear turret design. The power plant was also moved to the center of the vehicle. The driver remained at the front of the hull. Like on the Conqueror Mark II, he had a single periscope, in this case a number 16 Mark I periscope with a 110 degree field of view, mounted at the top of the upper glacis plate for vision. He would have had a large hatch above his head that would pop up and swing to the right. As with the FV214, traditional tiller bars would have been used to operate the vehicle. Also, the driver's seat could be placed at various heights and positions, allowing the driver to operate head out or under protection of a closed hatch. Extensions atop the tiller bars would allow for easy operation when driving head out. The glacis is listed as being a 4.9 inch thick steel plate sloped at 59 degrees. Side armor was to be 1 and 3 quarter inch thick plus 6 millimeter thin bazooka plates added over the running gear. The floor would have been 0.7 inches thick with an extra 0.6 inch mine plate installed below the driver's position. The roof of the hull would have been one and one quarter inch thick. Mounted at the rear of the hull, the new turret was large and boxy. Unlike the Conqueror's cast turret, the FV215's turret was to be of welded construction. Existing dimensions list the turret as 12 feet wide, sitting on a 95 inch diameter turret ring. Overall, the turret would have weighed 20 imperial tons. Unfortunately, the exact thickness of the turret armor is unknown, as records list the turret face only as will protect from 100mm gun in a 30 degree arc. The rear of the turret and roof would have been 0.6 inches thick. A feature carried over from the Conqueror was the rangefinder. On the FV215, this would have been used by the gunner, not the commander, as with the FV214. This was placed laterally across the front of the turret roof and was made by the York based company Cook, Thruton, and Sims. The rangefinder had a six foot sight base and used the coincidence method of ranging. This method consists of laying two images on top of each other. When the two images completely overlap, the range measurement is taken. This information is then used by the gunner to accurately range the gun. The commander, located on the left of the turret, would have been equipped with a large rotating cupola, designated the Cupola Vision No. 5, mounting a sight periscope AFV No. 11, along with a periscope tank No. 20 and No. 21, providing an uninterrupted view of 140 degrees. A collimator was also provided that would display the view of the gunner's main sight. 
two smoke dischargers, presumably the discharger smoke grenade number one Mark I, as on the Conqueror, would have been placed on the sides of the turret. Each launcher featured two banks of three tubes and were fired electrically from inside the tank. Atop the roof, on the hatch of the two loaders, was an air defense mounting point for a machine gun. This was set to be a 50 cal Browning M2 heavy machine gun, an uncommon choice for British vehicles of the era. The machine gun could elevate to 70 degrees and depress 5 degrees. Four boxes, totaling 950 rounds, were carried for the 50 cal. The Ordnance quick-firing 183mm tank L4 gun was one of the only parts of the FB215 that was built and tested. A small number of the guns were built, but it's unclear just how many. Records suggest at least 12. In an effort to get it into service before the development of the FB215 had finished, the War Office explored the idea of mounting it on the Centurion chassis. This resulted in the development of the experimental FV4005, a vehicle that would have been rushed into production should the Cold War have turned hot. A similar connection could be found with the Conqueror and the FV4004 Conway. Unfortunately, the exact length of the 183mm gun is unknown, but it was somewhere in the region of 15 feet long. It was fully rifled with a large bore evacuator placed roughly halfway down its length. The gun alone weighed 3.7 imperial tons, while its mount weighed 7.35 imperial tons. Although the turret was capable of full 360 degree traverse, firing was physically limited to a 90 degree arc, 45 degrees left and right of center. It could, however, also fire directly to the rear. A safety lock that lockout prevented the gun from firing over the broadside position. The gun would have had a vertical traverse range of plus 15 to minus 7 degrees. However, it is unclear whether it would have been fitted with a limiter that halted it at minus 5 degrees, as with the Conqueror. The gunner sat on the left of the gun, in front of the commander. This was unusual for British tanks, as it was more common for the gunner to be located on the right of the gun. He had controls for elevation and traverse, both of which were electrically powered. Duplicate controls were also available to the commander, but only the gunner was equipped with manual backups. The elevation controller also featured triggers for the main gun and coaxial machine gun. The gunner would aim the main armament via the sight periscope AFV No. 14 Mark I. The high explosive squash head was the only ammunition type to be produced for the 183mm gun. Both the shells and the propellant case were of gargantuan proportion. The shell weighed in at 160 pounds and measured 29 and 3 quarter inches long. The propellant case weighed 73 pounds and measured 26.85 inches long. The case contained a single charge that propelled the shell to a velocity of 2,350 feet per second. When fired, the gun produced 86 imperial tons of recoil force and had a recoil length of 27 inches. High explosive squash head shells have an advantage over regular kinetic energy rounds as their effectiveness does not decrease with distance. This shell type works via the shape charge method. Exploding on an armored surface, the concussive force delaminates the internal surface, sending large chunks of shrapnel bouncing around the interior of the target vehicle. Test firing of the L4 against a Conqueror and a Centurion proved how powerful the round was. In two shots, the 183mm high explosive squash head shell blew the turret clean off the Centurion and split the mantlet of the Conqueror in half. High explosive squash head could also serve as a dual-use round just as capable of engaging enemy armor as for use as a high explosive round against buildings, enemy defensive positions, or soft skin targets. This oversized ordnance is the reason the vehicle would be manned by two loaders. Between them, they could achieve a rate of two to two and a half rounds per minute. Also, due to its size, ammunition stowage was limited to just 20 rounds. 12 of these would have been ready rounds stowed in the turret against the interior of the walls. The size and power of the gun is also the reason why the rear turret design was chosen for the FB215. Because of its estimated 15 foot length, the gun would overhang the front of the vehicle considerably should it have been placed in a centrally mounted turret. This could lead to the gun being buried in the ground when approaching or descending steep inclines, fouling the barrel. Having the gun at the rear also made the vehicle a more stable firing platform as the front half of the vehicle would act as a counterweight of the recoil force, preventing the vehicle from tipping too far backwards. As well as the roof-mounted machine gun, the secondary armament consisted of a coaxial L3A1 30 cal machine gun, the British designation of the US Browning M1919A4. This was not coaxial in the traditional sense, as it was not integral to the main gun mount. Rather, the machine gun was placed in a blister cast into the roof with the rangefinder and located at the top right corner of the turret. The L3A1 had the same vertical traverse range as the main gun, Six boxes totaling 6,000 rounds were carried for the coaxial machine gun. 
While the Conqueror was equipped with the Rolls-Royce Meteor M120 petrol engine, it was plain that the FV215 would use the Rover M120 No. 2 Mark I. This 12-cylinder water-cooled petrol engine produced 810 horsepower at 2800 RPM. This would have propelled the vehicle to a top speed of 19.8 miles per hour. A Merritt Brown Z5R gearbox would also be installed, providing five forward gears and two reverse. Due to the turret being located at the rear of the vehicle, the power plant was placed centrally in the hull, separating the driver's compartment from the fighting compartment. The engine was also placed six inches off the center line, but whether this was to the left or right is unknown. The exhaust pipes would emerge from the sides of the hull roof just in front of the turret and terminate in large trumpet-like tubes. The reason for this is unknown. The rover engine would be fed by 250 imperial gallons of fuel. As with the Conqueror, a small auxiliary four-cylinder petrol engine was provided to drive a generator that would supply the vehicle with electrical power with or without the main engine running. Like the FV201, Centurion, and Conqueror before it, the FV215 was set to utilize the Horseman suspension system with two wheels per bogey unit. The wheels were made of steel measuring approximately 20 inches in diameter and constructed from three separate parts. These consisted of an outer and inner half with a steel rim in contact with the track. Between each layer was a rubber ring. The idea behind this was that it would be more efficient on the rubber and would not need to be replaced as often. The horseman suspension consisted of three horizontal springs mounted concentrically, guided by an internal rod and tube. This allowed each wheel to rise and fall independently, although the system did struggle if both wheels rose at the same time. Four bogies lined each side of the hull of the vehicle, giving it eight road wheels per side. There were also four return rollers, one per bogey. The advantages of using bogies lies in maintenance and crew comfort. Having externally mounted bogies means that there is more room inside the tank, and also, should the unit become damaged, it is relatively easy to remove and be replaced with a new unit. Despite the engine's frontal position, the drive sprockets remained at the rear of the running gear, with the idler wheel at the front. The track was 31 inches wide and had 102 links per side when new. The suspension gave the vehicle a ground clearance of 20 inches and the ability to climb a 35-inch vertical object. It allowed the tank to cross trenches up to 11 feet wide, negotiate gradients up to 35 degrees, and forward water obstacles up to 4.5 feet deep without preparation. The vehicle had a turning circle between 15 and 140 feet depending on gear selection, and could also pivot or neutral steer on the spot with each track turning in opposite directions. In 1951, the company of Vickers had filed a report on the concept of the FV215, and by June 1954, a contract had been signed for the production of a prototype vehicle known as P1. In October that year, it was also clear that the AA mount for the 50 cal machine gun would not be ready, and as such, an L3A1 was substituted. In March 1955, the same year the FV214 entered service, the order had increased to include two pre-production vehicles. A full-scale mock-up, including interior components and a faux engine, was completed between July 1955 and January 1957, with 80% of a company schematics also produced. Work started on P1 in September 1955 with selection of spare parts. The two pre-production vehicles were cancelled in early 1956, but work went ahead on P1, which was set to be completed at some point in 1957. Troop trials would then take place by the end of that year. This, however, is where the FV215 story ends. In 1957, with just the gun, a couple of turret faces, and a number of other smaller parts built, the FV215 project was officially cancelled. This decision was largely down to the Army. From the outset, the Army was not keen on the concept of the vehicle, mostly due to the fact that large caliber weapons provide a number of logistical issues, mostly caused by the sheer dimension of the weapons. One only has to look at the Conqueror and the issues its size presented its operators during its time in service to understand the hostility to the FV215. At the same time, there was a new contender in the race to find an opponent to the USSR's heavy armor. Of course, by the mid-1960s, the FV-215's intended opponent, the IS-3, would prove to be a far less threatening tank than the Allies had imagined roughly 12 years prior, in 1945. The new contender was the FV-4010, a heavily modified turretless vehicle built on the Centurion chassis and armed with the newly developed Makara anti-tank guided missile. This vehicle offered the same damage potential as the 183mm gun, but in a lighter vehicle and with better accuracy at long ranges. Even though this vehicle also went through full-scale development, it too would not see production or service. The Makara missile, however, was accepted for service. Had the FV215 entered service, it would have filled the role much of the same as the Conqueror. Its role on the battlefield would have been to support other friendly troops rather than strike out on its own. 
It was designed to destroy enemy tanks from afar, covering the advance of lighter tanks such as the FV-4007 Centurion. In offensive operations, the FV-215 would be placed in overwatch positions and fire over the heads of the main force as it advanced. In defensive operations, the vehicle would again take an overwatch role, but this time from key preset strategic positions to meet an advancing enemy. Over the years, a couple of erroneous designations have emerged concerning this vehicle. These are the FV-215A and FV-215B. The FV-215A is the false designation, probably mistaken for the planned AVRE vehicles of the FV-200 series. The FV-215B is simply a fictional designation of the FV-215 heavy gun tank. FV-215B is also used as a vehicle in Wargaming's World of Tanks. This vehicle is an FV-200 chassis with a rear-mounted Conqueror turret and the 120mm L1A1 gun, and is almost certainly a fake vehicle. Had it entered service, there is no doubt that the FV-215 would have been one of the most deadly gun tanks to ever have existed. At the same time, it is not hard to see why it was not accepted for service. The Conqueror, on the other hand, the tank the FV-215 was designed to replace, would end up staying in service, finally being retired in 1966. The logistical and high-cost nightmare of the Conqueror would have only continued with the more heavily armed FV-215. Heavy vehicles are expensive not only to build, but to maintain. The heavier a vehicle, the harder the wear and tear on parts, so parts have to be replaced more often, increasing maintenance time and burden, and so on. On top of this, there was another issue. The feared Soviet heavy tanks like the IS-3 were not being made in the massive numbers expected, indicating a shift in policy to more maneuverable and more lightly armored tanks. The need for the Conqueror and for the FV-215 from this perspective was simply becoming absent. Other changes were also taking place, as technology-wise, larger caliber guns with their huge ammunition were becoming obsolete by improved anti-armor performance of smaller guns and by the appearance of a new generation of accurate anti-tank guided missiles. It is perhaps ironic that the Soviet tank which perhaps started this fear, the IS-3, was itself found to be seriously wanting in combat. Losses during the invasion of Prague to little more than lightly armed civilians showed serious tactical failings in the way in which the tanks were handled, along with the utter disaster of their use in the 1967 Six-Day War with Israel. Here, Egyptian IS-3s were lost in large numbers to mechanical failures and to inferior, lighter tanks the British supplied Centurion and American supplied M48. The Paper Tiger had had its day, and the IS-3 smashing heavy gun tanks were as obsolete as the tanks they were designed to counter.